about. The objective is that we have substantive conversation about the things that really matter. Uh, so oftentimes we're talking about things that don't significantly move our lives forward. They don't, they don't move the pendulum, if you will, in one direction significantly or the other. I want to re-embed. I, I want to weave into the fabric of our community conversations about news and conversations about politics and conversations about religion. And so that's what we do on the James Galliard Show. And so I want to start today with just we're talking a little bit about what we did since we were together last. It's been a week. Since we were together last, I want to highlight three things that I did that I think were noteworthy. First of all, I was I was had an opportunity to hang out last Tuesday at the Institute of Emerging Issues at North Carolina State University, and uh, we had some conversations on financial resiliency, the danger of payday loans, uh, the danger of pawn shops, the the, the danger of certain elements. Um, financial institutions, uh, some check cashing places, um, some of those dangers and fintech and things like that, the exorbitant fees that that many of these agencies are, are imposing upon people as a way to bypass interest rates that could potentially be regulated. And so I want to begin with a question today. I want to challenge a little bit about money because here's the deal. Um, you know, you could be healthy and and you could have family, but but here's the truth of the matter. If I'm struggling paying my bills, you know, if I've got more month than I have money, if I'm really struggling to get ahead, that's just not fun. You know, I can tell you, you know, I'm far from a wealthy man, but I've had a little bit of money and I've been broke. And having a little bit of money is always a little bit better. And so here's my question for you. How much of your check does it take for you to live? Your net check, when you get your money in your hand, how much of your net check does it take for you to live? I always tell my children um, if, and I'm going to start so you know, just need a little time for me to work this out. I'm going to start a time where we're going to have a, a daily poll. Uh, when we get on on Mondays, I'm going to have a poll for you. If I had a poll for us today, it would be, do you need 50%? I mean, can you live on half of your take-home check? Or do you need 100%? Or do you need even more that you're using credit cards? I want to submit to you that you should not be living on more than about 70% of your take-home income. If you're living on more than 70% of your take-home income, it's a really good chance that you're living above and beyond your means. And so I want to encourage you about that. So I started my day uh, last week since we were together last, NC State University. Then, But here's the deal, y'all. Friday, right? Friday, I get invited to speak at Nash Correction. I went to prison at Nash. There's over 800 men in that prison. I had an opportunity to speak for Black History Month. Many of those men are listening to our, our broadcast at Word Tabernacle Church on Sundays right here on Choice FM. And, um, and we get amazing testimonies. But I was blown away by the brilliance. I was blown away by the compassion. I was blown away by the stories and the narrative. And I got to thinking about what Grandmama says, there by the grace of God go I. Y'all, their band, their band was banging. They had a brother on keys, a brother on bass, and a brother on drums. It was, they were good. They were good. They were better than most church bands. And I was like, you know what, man, what great potential, what great talent is in, is here in prison. And I got to talking. So I talked to a brother who was arrested at 23, uh, felony murder charge. He's already done 23 years. He's 46 years old. He's still young. He's brilliant. He's written books. And the, the key, the thing is, there is currently no legislation that would give them any opportunity to be paroled. And I was, you say, well, but, 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 gee, he committed murder. But even if it were a family member of mine, I think this, I'm convinced the criminal justice system should be rehabilitative. I don't believe in the death penalty. I believe ultimately that's a whole nother conversation, right? Like how people that are, are anti-abortion are pro-death penalty and anti-immigration. That's a whole nother conversation that I'm going to log in that we talk about. But, but I think part of the reason we have to be serious about our voting so that we can give brothers and sisters that have had, that made a mistake, 
that they might truly have an opportunity for rehabilitation. They might truly have an opportunity to have a second chance in life. Who are we, particularly those of us who profess Christ, who don't want to see people have another opportunity? And so since we were together last, I spent some time at NC State. I spent some time at Nash Correction. And then I was with my father in the ministry at Triumph Missionary Baptist Church in Philadelphia. That was the home church that I came from. I had an opportunity to preach their family and their friends' day. And I always ask you every Monday at 5 when we get together, what did your pastor preach? So go ahead and type that in. Uh, Go ahead and call in and let me know. Again, we're taking calls. uh, 252-937-7400. What did your pastor preach? When I was in Philadelphia, I preached um, about Rahab. And I preached about Rahab being in rehab. And I preached about how the future of the church is going to rest upon our ability to attract Rahabs. And I preached from House of Shame to Hall of Fame. And so that was what I did since we'd been together last. What have you been what have you been doing since we've been together last? And so I want to know about that, but I want to jump right into our first segment. So I'm going to take a quick little break. And then once we come back from this break, I want to talk about a quick question about our emotional health. And then we're going to have a conversation about sports. And then before you know it, I'll be time at 530 to bring in our special studio guest. Thank you for tuning in. This is the James Galliott Show right here on Choice FM. Would you go ahead and share this, tag a friend, and get ready to call 919-872-9210, 252-937-7400. I'll be right back with a whole bunch of information that's going to get you thinking. You may not agree, but we're going to be talking and thinking. I'll be right back. This is the James Galliott Show. The James Gellier Show on Choice of on Choice FM. Welcome back, my people. This is James Gellier. Welcome back to the James Gellier Show. 919-872-9210, 252-937-7400. I love to talk with you, even though I have a whole lot of content, a whole lot of commentary I want to share. But I'm going to go to the callers real quick and go to the phones. Ms. Harris from Zebulon, you want to tell me about your pastor real quick before I get into this next segment? Sure, I can. How are you today? I'm well. Welcome to the show. That's good. Thank you. This is my first time actually hearing you. I did see um, that you were on a couple times, but this is my first time. I'm glad I caught it. It's been good so far. So the church I usually watch um, virtually is Berean Christian Church in Stone Mountain, Georgia. And um, yesterday, they were talking about, can we all just get along? And it was just all about forgiveness and how, um, you know, a lot of times we tend to hold different things against people. It could just be a very slight misunderstanding or it could be for good reasons. But, you know, just um, the message of forgiveness and just sometimes we feel like someone has done like the worst of the worst or maybe they're just irritating us or whatever, but God always, you know, forgives. So we should forgive. And so that's, that's really pretty much what I got out of yesterday. Well, I look, look, I, we, we all have fallen short. Right. And so that's, that's a good word. And so, um, I appreciate you sharing that. I appreciate you calling in. We we need to get your information from Doc on the studio. So, Doc, before she hangs up, get her contact him. Get an email from her because cause I'm going to send you a gift card. You, you're you the first person to ever call the show. And so so I want to make sure oh, that wow. we uh, acknowledge you. So so thank you for calling. I hope you'll listen. I'm on every Monday uh, from 5 to 6, and we may be adding some shows if, if people like what they're hearing. So I appreciate you calling oh, today, and I appreciate that word on forgiveness, Ms. Harris from Zebulon. You have a great day. Thank you so much. You too. So, folks, I want to talk about emotional health. I, I um, On this segment, um, I want to ask you a question. Okay. Ms. Harris, you still on and This is just real talk. Yes, I'm here. Perfect, perfect. All right, I'm going to get a little bit of information from you, okay? All right, and let's start with, can you spell your first and last name? Doc, I'm still on. Doc, I can hear you. I'm still on. So this is James Garrett again. We're working on some technical issues with our studio folk. I appreciate that. So I want to talk about emotional health. Um, And this is a serious conversation, a serious question for all of you. Um, let me lay, let me lay out some data first because you know I don't like to drive largely on emotion. 
I want us to really think through and critically on issues, right? Racial and ethnic minorities have health that is worse overall than the health of white Americans. So when we talk about things like health disparities, they can stem from economic determinants. Our health disparities can be as a result of education. Our health disparities can be a result of geography and of neighborhood. They can be a result of environment. Health disparities can be a result of low quality care, what low quality health care that is. It can be a result of inadequate access to care or inability to navigate the healthcare system or provider bias or just stress. And our studies show that examining the role of safe social and biological stress on health suggests a link between social economic status and ethnic disparities in stress and health. So here's my question. And can I, can I, let me JDGV that. That's my church talk. You know, we preach from the New International Version of the Bible. That's the NIV or the King James Version. That's the KGV or the New King James. So when I say I'm going to JDGV it, it just means it's the James David Gallier Version. Um, what Basically what I'm saying to us, because our audience is largely um, African-American, um, largely black and indigent, in, indigenous, um, and here are people of color. So the BIPOC community, here's my question to you. What are you currently doing to ensure your emotional, mental, and physical health? How are you being deliberate and intentional to make sure that you are emotionally healthy, physically healthy, and that you are mentally healthy? I want to suggest to us, y'all, that we need an outlet because just JDG V in it, just being BIPOC, just being black, it's its own stressor. Is if we didn't have, if we didn't have any of the other issues, if we didn't have social economic issues, if if we didn't have economic issues, if we didn't have education issues, just the stress alone of being black in America is a high level of stress. So whether or not you recognize it, just being who you are creates its own level of stress. And so what I want to just leave you with is I want us all to be very intentional about what we do for our emotional health, our mental health, and our physical health. Um, I've been journeying lately. Our church is on a fast. And so, you know, I've been drinking more water. I've been watching my intake. I've been, I've been more deliberate about my morning devotion. And now I've got to find some other healthy outlets. Somebody shout healthy outlets. I'm not talking about drinking or smoking or sexing my way into a healthier place. I'm talking about a legitimate healthier outlet. I'm talking about working out, going for a walk, reading a book, riding a bike, getting on your motorcycle, uh, getting having a spa day, going out for a nice dinner, going to a movie, hanging out with your boo. I'm talking about shutting down social media and the toxicity that oftentimes can be attached to it and just doing something for you. You know, doing a crossword puzzle, doing a puzzle, playing some spades, some pinochles, some bid whist, you know, um, what are you doing for your mental health, your emotional health, and your physical health? I, wanted, I want you to know. I want you to feel this across the airways. I love you too much to see you check out early. I love you too much to see you in a frenzy emotionally. And so I want to encourage you to really be thoughtful and prayerful about what you're doing for your emotional health, your physical health, and your mental health. Think about that for a moment. So here, let's, let's shift the gears real quick, y'all. I want to talk sports. Uh, who watched the NBA All-Star Game uh, last night? Y'all, come on, family. Real talk. 211 to 186. Who honestly feels like a basketball game that's all about showcasing talent offensively with no defense is entertaining? Like, I'm sorry, NBA, and y'all may disagree with me, but I'm sorry. 211 points east, 186 points west. Damian Lillard, Lillard, 39 points, lead MVP. I mean, I mean, Lord, just, I understand lots of people broke records. I understand that there was like an offensive master class. And But the reality of it is, I think the average fan, the average NBA pundit is saying, like, we want a real basketball game. 
Like, I guess you do have 211 points if don't nobody play defense. I guess so. And so I was so disappointed by the direction, man. When I was coming up, you know, back in the day, when I, we were watching the NBA game, you know, in the day of, of Magic Johnson and Larry Bird and Dr. J and Charles Barkley, I mean, when we were, we were watching the NBA game, and it was a real game. I mean, they were posting up. They were going hard in the paint. And I just think, man, you got to go hard in the paint, people. I mean, we, what, are we, what, are we, what are we showing the world? That life is just a big game where nobody competes against anyone. No one challenges anyone. Just give everybody. Whoever wants to take the half-court shot, take the half-court shot. Whoever wants to just dunk in a reverse. I mean, if we don't ever see another dunk again, can we just get a good basketball game? I don't know what your thought is about that. But, but I mean, I think the, the NBA All-Star game has a whole lot more potential. And I think we have, it's gotten lackadaisical. This lackadaisical defense, and it's just, I think it's frustrating viewers. So, I, I'm sorry. I, I was disappointed. I watched a little bit of the game. But when I'm watching these scores just go up and no defense, I wasn't feeling it. You might lose me next year, NBA as a viewer, uh, halftime show I enjoy. You know, I think it could have been just a little bit longer, but I, I enjoyed. Um, so w- let me tell you what I did appreciate about um, the NBA All-Star Game. And this is James Galliard. You're listening to the James Galliard Show. And um, I'm right here on Choice FM. And if you want to listen online, I love choicefm.com. And, of course, at I Love Choice FM on all of the outlets, you can listen to the show. Um, you're invited to call in. We've been taking callers. Um, and, and, and those numbers are in the 919-872-9210 and the 252-937-7400. Um, but let me say what I did like. What I appreciated about the All-Star game was was the three-point shootout with uh, Steph Curry and Sabrina um, Anescu. Um, love her playing, love him, love the fact that they both did that, loved how competitive she is, and I love how women are being elevated in professional athletics. Um, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm probably going to watch women's Final Four more so than the men's. I love the fact that women have been elevated. Um, we have women commentators. I shout out all of the outlets, particularly NBA for that. So that I'm going to give one plus. You know, I try to see the good and not just the negative and stuff. I um, mean, the other thing that I want to raise before we take a break and get ready for our studio guests, the other thing I want to raise about athletics, I want your opinion on this. What do you think? Um, Caitlin Clark, that's the sister, white girl from University of Iowa. Now, listen, for those of you that hear me talk about brother, white girl, all that, it, look, my mama was white, my dad's black. I just kind of naturally deal with racial stuff. I don't mean anything negative to anybody. I just have to be who I am. And so Caitlin Clark broke the all-time women's scoring record uh, for female athletics um, in collegiate basketball. She is um, a player at University of Iowa. But what I want to talk, and so shout her out, right? What, what jumped out for me, though, is I personally, now I'm sure she has had endorsements and what they call these nil agreements, right? These NIL, these name, image, and likeness agreements where now collegiate players can be paid for their name, for their image, or for their likeness. I'd love to know what you think about that. I'm, I'm, I'm sure she probably had some name, image, and likeness um, contracts or sponsorships, but I was surprised to see when I was watching the NBA All-Star game, she pops up. Um, in a State Farm commercial. And I personally had never seen her in a commercial. And I was like, wow, she breaks the record. And now here she is. I was reading some of the some of the money that some of these athletes are making, what the valuations are. Um, her evaluation is knocking on the million-dollar door, 800000 Angel Reese um, with LSU, $1.7 million. Um, Olivia Dunn, who is the LSU gymnast, is through the charts um, into the millions. Um, and so what do you think about these nil agreements, these name, 
image and likeness sponsorships and endorsements of collegiate players. I I have mixed feelings that when I, I do think they need to be paid. If, if the university is making the kind of money they're making and funding all of the other programs and things that they're funding off of uh, the skill set of these athletes, I think they do get, need to get more than a collegiate education out the deal. Um, but then I struggle with the fact that it's more beneficial for me to remain in college than it is to graduate because I get more money as a collegiate player than I would. I mean, the starting salary for a WNBA player is $75,000. These players are making, you know, hundreds of thousands in college. And they won't make that that as a professional. So I struggle a little bit with the nil kind of prohibiting them from moving on um, because it is so robust and so lucrative. And so... Look, this is the James Galliott Show. We're going to take a break real quick. When we come back uh, from paying some bills and listening to a little music, we're going to have a special guest in the studio, and we're going to get into a serious conversation about early voting and elections. Again, this is James Galliott. Tune in, invite a friend, share it with somebody. We'll be right back. The James Galliott Show on Choice FM. Voters in Nash, Edgecombe, and Wilson County, it's time to meet Alicia Slaughter, the seasoned attorney ready to shake things up as your District 8 court judge. Alicia stands for honesty, transparency, and restoring faith in our justice system. And hey, let's not forget, the courts could use a little more ballot. They need a woman on the bench. Alicia Slaughter wants you to vote on March 5th. We can restore faith in our courts together. Transparency, honesty, and yes, balance too. Mark your calendar. March 5th is the day to make a difference. Vote Alicia Slaughter for District 8 Court Judge. Paid for by the Committee to Elect Alicia Slaughter. Early voting is from now until March 2nd. And Election Day is on March 5th. If you ever loved real hard, then this is the show for you. Get ready for the Love Hard Tour. Keisha Cole. Let it go. Trey Songz.
Our Choice FM. Choice. 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 The James Gellier Show on Choice FM. Well, welcome back, everybody. Glad you are here. Listen, this thing is crazy, right? And so they drop an ad at Choice FM for Alicia Slaughter. I was calling her Alicia all this time. My apologies for Alicia Slaughter. And lo and behold, as they're dropping the ad for Alicia Slaughter for district court, she walks into our studios. Listen, family, the North Carolina Constitution divides state government into three branches, right? Legislative, executive, and judicial. Our judicial branch is the court system. They interpret our Constitution. They make decisions about our laws and what our laws mean, the consequences of people who break our laws, right? And our court system is separated into three divisions, the appellate division, the superior court division, and our district court dis uh, uh, division. In studio is a candidate for district court, Alicia Slaughter. Alicia, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I am thrilled. Can you educate people watching and listening, first of all, on who Alicia, Sla Alicia Slaughter is, <laughs> and secondly, on what happens at the d district court level? Sure. So Alicia Slaughter is um, a, the baby of the bunch. My mom had two girls. I am the baby, but I tell everyone I'm the little big sister, right? Because <laughs> my sister often calls me for advice and my mom and we kind of have this triangle going where we're all texting and calling each other. Um, I'm originally from Orlando, Florida. And so for those of you who see my campaign signs, it's orange and blue. And that was very intentional because I am from Orange County, Florida. And I came to Orange County, North Carolina to attend the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill Law School. So that is the orange uh, recognizing and honoring those roots from Orlando, Florida to Chapel Hill. And then I moved east. Um, I am, my friends would say, very competitive. Okay. Um, love to be with family, friends, have a good time. Uh, love to travel. I'm a football girl. So, um, Pastor G, I know I was here on <laughs> representing um, the Dallas Cowboys that Sunday, and you have a strong contingency <laughs> in your congregation, so those are my people. Unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> my husband and I actually started talking talking about the Cowboys. That, that wow. was our initial conversation. That is kind of what brought us together. I love for football, the Dallas Cowboys. Um, like basketball as well, so I'm into sports, traveling, and I love a good audiobook. So that's nice. a little about me outside of the work that I do. Why are you running for district court judge? Uh, quite simply because there was a need. Um, I teach my kids, and one of our family mottos is, if you see a need, feel the need. Um, and I remember hearing the speech that Nadia Cooper, shout out to Nadia um, for her oratorical speech when she said, Miss Ayana taught her that you don't have to ask for permission to lead. And I think that really sums up what is happening with me. Um, our district court bench is comprised of seven judges. Um, the only woman on the bench, Elizabeth Freshwater Smith, was promoted to one of the superior court seats that was created by the North Carolina legislature. So that left a vacancy, and that's the seat I'm running for. And so um, when I sat back and kind of saw how things were playing out and hearing the rumblings of the people who were interested, um, there was not another woman candidate uh, at the time. Um, that I was aware of, and nor was there a person of color who was interested in the seat. And so when I thought about the composition of our bench and the fact that we should be representative of the community, mm -hmm. I said, you know what, it's time to step up. Um, and so I did. I filed, and it has been a whirlwind, but that is what birthed this campaign. So educate us around what happens, what type of cases do you see in district court? Because what I want to do on the show, Alicia, is connect the dots for voters, mm -hmm. right? Because I think oftentimes people don't recognize how important these seats are in their community. You right. know, I mean, the truth of the matter is, and I, I you know, I have my preferences on who's going to become president and yes. who's going to win Congress and who's going to U.S. Senate. But when it comes to trying a case here in Nash, Edgecombe, Wilson County, they're gonna, they have no jurisdiction over right. that. It's going to be you. Yes. And so talk to us about connecting the dots for those voters. 
what kind of low level I'm guessing maybe lower level criminal cases maybe yes. civil cases help us understand that so I tell people district court is the people's court um, okay. it is your lower level cases so that's your traffic you get a speeding ticket um, those expired registrations driving while license revokes those things are handled in district court as well as um, the legislature just uh, mandated that H and I felonies be handled in district court. Um, in addition, your divorces, um, child abuse, ne abuse, dependency, and neglect, which is referred to as A and D court, child support, um, those type of things, in appealed um, civil cases that come from the magistrate are also handled in district court by the district court judges. So I say it's the people's court because those are the things that people who have minor interactions are going to be in and out and they see the biggest number of people. Yeah, and that, and that, and I appreciate that explanation. I was really educated recently. I was just recently appointed to the um, commission for sentencing and mm -hmm. And I had a meeting, an orientation meeting, and they're giving me this stuff that y'all probably have memorized, right? With these, <laughs> and but what what shocked me was the uh, the discretion mm -hmm. that judges have. Yes, I mean it could all it could be it could be fifty months, mm -hmm. sixty month window in terms of the minimums right. where they start and where they could end. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important that people recognize, to your point. Representation matters, yes. and I think there's great discretion. Y'all have so much discretion. Mm -hmm. We do want people that's going to be fair and fair-minded right. as it relates to passing on sentences and everything. Yes, and especially in those civil cases, because a lot of times, like you said, it's in the discretion of the judge or what's in the best interest of the child. And when you talk about um, terminating parental rights and how to look at those things, what you're assessing, um, I think the criminal side is definitely more structured, the law some people say is always gray but it's more defined but in those civil cases it is a lot more discretionary and so that's when a person's background their view on life and how we are taking this individual who came in or these parties in this dispute i think um, makes a difference yeah that's really good I, I let me ask you i'm gonna i'm gonna go personal because i think people need to know people as people yes so what would the alicia today say to the 18 to 20 year old Alicia as you've lived life you've gotten married you've graduated mm -hmm. college you've gone to law school you have a family you have a career mm -hmm. as you're reflecting back speaking to other particularly african-american girls yes what life lesson jumps out for you that you would be like sis you need to know this or remember this um I would say life is a journey right and the biggest thing is enjoy the journey I think I've always been a person that's very goal oriented and working towards the next thing. You accomplish a goal and it's on to the next thing. And I think taking the time and having the ability to sit back and enjoy the moment and enjoy the ride is what I would say. Um, and to do things that you never thought you would do. Um, I was just talking to someone about, I think my biggest regret going through college and law school was not traveling abroad and doing those study abroad programs because mm. I was, I'm a very practical person. And so when I came to law school, I was paying out of state tuition. And so when the opportunity presented itself to go study abroad, I was like, I'm gonna have to pay this money back. So <laughs> I didn't, but I wish I had of because those are opportunities that you don't get back sometimes. And so enjoy the ride and don't always be, um, don't always think necessarily about what the outcome will be mm -hmm. as far as what the cost is of that thing because sometimes it'll take care of itself in the end because I've been a public servant shout out to the public service loan forgiveness program my loans are actually forgiven wow. because I served the community um, in excess of 10 years awesome. and so I was able to take part of that program and so it wouldn't have mattered right. I, and that's an experience <laughs> that I missed out on right right that's a good word and so let's bring the voters back in on voting we're obviously in mm -hmm. early voting yes um, talk to us about why you think everything Every vote matters and why you're and why you're asking for people to vote for you well I know every vote matters um, and I'm asking people to vote because simply put I, I am the best choice um, and not to get into 
my background and my resume, but I think it's important for people to know that I am the only candidate that is board certified criminal law specialist. That's important. That's the state of North Carolina has said Alicia Slaughter knows what she's doing as it relates to criminal law. Um, in addition, that piece of having equity on the bench and um, for the listeners to just understand out of a bench of seven in all the years that we have been here, there has never been a woman of color um, elected to the position. Um, in addition to that, I've done the work before I got here. I think you can tell a person by what they've done. And so I don't just talk about it. As they say, I've been standing on business since I've been <laughs> here. I've been serving the community. Um, I've done the Meals on Wheels, the team court, working with law enforcement, basic law enforcement training courses, doing mock trials to help get them ready to hit the street um, and be fair and follow the law. Um, I've done those things. I've spent the hours with families, um, working cases. Um, I've stayed late and put in the work. And so I think when you serve in that capacity, there comes a time that um, you can be rewarded for that service. And I feel like that's where I, I am now. It's not new to me, the idea of serving. And so I am asking for that vote so that I can serve the citizens of Nash, Edgecombe, and Wilson in a new capacity as district court judge. Well, look, I couldn't have said it any better. You heard it directly from Alicia Slaughter. She's asking for your vote. If you live in Nash, Edgecombe, or Wilson counties, listen, family, your vote matters. I want to talk to my sisters real quick. I mean, no shade, okay? Y'all know on this show we call it straight, right? And your, my objective is not for everybody to agree with me, but I want us talking about substantive matters. I mean, real talk, when we had Sherry Beasley at the top of the ticket, um, black women voted in smaller numbers than they did in the previous election. And, mm -hmm. look, we got a sister on the ticket here in Nash, Edgecombe, and Wilson County. And, I, you know, y'all know I went through the ballot last week, and I was clear that I'm voting for Alicia Slaughter. Um, and I'm just asking y'all to do the same. And, look, take a hard look at her resume. She's laid out her curriculum vitae and her qualifications Early voting is going on now. Mm -hmm. Early voting ends on March 2nd, and then Election Day is on March 5th. It is incumbent, folk, that we vote, and we vote our best interest in the interest of our community. So this is the James Galliott Show. Had the wonderful opportunity to interview and have a conversation with my friend, and I believe we're going to be our next district court judge, yes. Alicia Slaughter. Yes, yes. Alicia, thank you for stopping in to see us. Thank you. Y'all, we'll be right back after this announcement. The James Galliott Show. On Choice FM. My testimony is simply, he turned it. Why y'all so quiet right here?
James Gellier Show on Choice FM. Welcome back, everyone. Glad you are here. I was checking out some of my Facebook folk, a whole bunch of y'all. Man, our, our, our viewership is increasing every week. I don't know what the number's going to be before Choice FM says we're going to add a day to him, but we'll see where that goes. I want to remind you, you know, this show, I want to talk about substantive things. I want to talk about things that matter. Send me an email, pastor at wordtab.net, uh, or, or, or call into the studios. Tell us what you want us talking about because it's important that that this is your show, right? I'm I'm moderating, I'm hosting, but I really want to touch on things that are substantive for our community. And so we talked a little bit about mental health today. We talked a little bit about sports today. We talked a little bit about what we've done for the weekend. Let me shift gears a little bit. I don't have a whole lot of time left. I'm, I'm going to wrap up at 5.56 or so today. Um, let me remind you about early voting. It began February 15th. It extends until March 2nd. Um, and then Election Day, of course, is March uh, 5th. And so polls are open during the week, 8 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. And then on the weekends from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. Saturday and Sunday. If you're in Nash County, you have uh, two locations. That's Nash Ag Center and Braswell Memorial Library. There are seven early voting locations in Durham, 13 in Wake County. I need to get the Edgecombe County and Halifax County numbers because I'm getting... I'm starting to get callers and information from those areas. And so, please, people, let's make sure we are voting. It is so important that we do. I want to I wanna ruffle everybody's feathers with this last segment. This is a segment I'm calling Think Before You Clap. Think Before You Clap. And um, I got a lot of feedback going on, Doc, on my mic. I'm hearing, like, a delay in what I'm t- communicating. Um, so I want to do a piece on think before you clap. The first piece that I want to talk about on think before you clap, um, is former president Donald Trump, uh, former president Donald Trump. And I want to give a shout out. I have some people from Philly. I was just in Philly. Um, and I want to shout y'all out, Ms. Brenda Jenkins and some other folk that are on air and some of the others that are watching here in Rocky Mount. Appreciate y'all. Uh, think before you clap. Uh, former President Donald Trump, uh, last week he was talking about uh, NATO. That's the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And he said if they did not meet their s- defense spending targets, that um, he would set off alarms in all of Europe. And he would basically tell Russia to attack the NATO allies that were considered de- delinquent. For those of you that don't know, um, you're required to pay two and a half percent of your gross domestic product um, on NATO expenses, on your defense expenses. And so Donald Trump was in a campaign rally in South Carolina. He, first of all, told about this alleged story of a conversation he had supposedly with somebody that was head of a NATO member country that did not meet their obligations. And his statement was, he said, if you didn't meet your obligations, then, then he said, I would tell Russia to do whatever the H-E-L-L they want to do. Um, and then a bunch of people in the background started applauding. First of all, he's very unlikely to have had the conversation. Um, second of all, it's just dangerous, dangerous, dangerous um, innuendo, if you will. And I just was surprised by the applause of the room as if people are not critically thinking through things. They don't understand. The people applauding, they more than likely don't know how NATO works. They more than likely don't know the potential damage a statement like that could mean to international relations and defense relations and offensive relations. And and so so that that's like, folks, just process stuff before you clap, all right? Think before you clap. But I wanna I wanna shift gears. Here's my other think before you clap. Um, and that is the Fulton County District Attorney, Fannie Willis. I've been really surprised by seeing the response of this. I think I'm I want to understand this better. I want us to talk in detail about this next week, which is why I'm queuing it this week. Because I want to talk to my sisters. I've been watching the response of sisters, see if I can find the quote real quick. Um, the uh, Melanie Campbell, the president and CEO of the National Coalition of Black Civic Participation. She said, 
I love that she stood up for herself, but I hate the fact that she had to. Um, she said when she saw the video of the testimony, she felt, why are you all treating her like she's on trial? And I'm, I'm just a little surprised by, and let me be very clear, I, you, you cannot become district uh, attorney in Fulton County, Georgia, uh, I'm talking about Fannie Willis, without being a really bright person. And so this is not about intellect, but I do think when you are trying a case potentially of the highest profile human being to have lived on the earth in a while, Donald Trump, and at the same time, one of the most controversial people to have lived on the earth, I do think character is significant. And I do think we have to love what we're doing and want to protect what we're doing from a perspective that we protect it from ourselves even. And so I don't know if it's right or wrong, if she did it or didn't do it. What I will say is when her father is being um, questioned on the stand, when she's being questioned on the stand, then yes, she is on the stand. And yeah, the, the bigger issue here is Donald Trump and the prosecution of him. But if there is any um, truth to her relationship with Nathan Wade, um, that it does warrant some consideration. And I think we live in this culture where people feel like, well, just because someone is smart and well-educated and they do a good job, then their character and their morality isn't at play. And I just don't think that's right. And understand, I'm not judging. I'm not condemning. I'm just shocked by the applause. I'm shocked by our applauding people. Like, I'm having, you know, I'm not married. I'm in this relationship. I'm in an affair with a person that works for me and or I work with. And our, what we're doing could potentially damage the case against Donald Trump. And then everybody's supposed to act like that's not a big deal. And I think it is a big deal. Um, and I think that. I don't know. I don't think that the standard for disqualification has been met. And I don't think she's going to be disqualified from the role or from being able to try the case. But I don't think that's the end of it. And I think as a public servant, we're obligated to discharge the duties of our office in accordance with what's in the best interest of the people that we're doing it for. So even as a pastor, I think I have an obligation to do things that are in the best interest of the people that I pastor. And I think if you're an elected official, if you're a public servant, then I do think we have an obligation to do what's right for people, the people that we serve. And in this case, I don't know that she did that. And I think for me, this was something that I think I probably would have been more neutral on and not like jumped on the applauding. And so I was wondering, like, are we not thinking before we're applauding? And so next week, I hope I get inundated with calls from black women who are like, no, man, you got this wrong because you're not a sister and you don't understand our plight and you don't understand our dilemma. And so I, I want to talk about that. I understand that as black women, I mean, you know, we y'all can feel attacked. I know as a black man, I feel attacked. Um, but I do think that we can do a better job of not of not hurting ourselves. You know, y'all know that song. We sing it in church sometimes, Lord, deliver me, because all I seem to do is keep hurting me, hurting me. And so I want to throw that out as a consideration that whether it is Donald Trump's statement about NATO or whether it is it is the, the issue that's going on with the Fulton County uh, District Attorney, um, I think we want to be really, really careful that before we applaud stuff, we stop and think. And we process and we, you know, we kind of interpret it and we do some critical thinking of it before we weigh in on it, that we all lose, use our influence um, in a responsible way. Look, I'm out of clock, but I'm not out of content. I had other things that I wanted to talk to you about, like the three school systems in Halifax County. And then I had another a final thought that I wanted to share about private schools. And then I had my whole Black History Month. But I'm out of time. This is the James Galliott Show. I hope you'll tune in every single Monday. 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. as we talk about things that matter in our community to make all of our lives better. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you next Monday right here on Choice FM on The James Gallier Show. The James Gallier Show on Choice FM. What's better than winning a prize on a Multiply the Cash scratch-off? Oh, uh, hello? <laughs> 
Well, I guess I'd say probably... Winning every single prize. What's better than winning every single prize? I can't think winning of... Winning every prize times two with the win-all doubler. Well, you don't need me here, so I'm going to go pick up a scratch-off. You multiply the cash from the North Carolina Education Lottery with a chance to win every prize doubled. Must be 18 to play. Approximate overall odds of winning range from 1 in 3.77 to 4.71. Problem gambling helpline, 877-718-5543. Diner, 132 South Church Street, Rocky Mount. Juicy burgers, hot, delicious wings, yummy spaghetti, and the first pizza to ever be served downtown Rocky Mount. Hot, delicious pizza and more at Pop's Diner. Pop's Diner for hot dogs. Pop's Diner for lunch. Open daily from 11 till 7 p.m. City workers get the Pop's hookup. Pop's Diner. Open from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Wings, pizza, burgers, spaghetti, salads, and more. Hot, fresh, and and fast at Pop downtown Rocky Mountain. Open 11 8 to 7 p.m. Monday through Saturday. Can I 